I'm going to go talk. I'm going to go talk. Okay, we're going to have two standalones. But I'm going to keep you and do and then we'll all discuss whatever you want. I think of myself as a moderator of the panel still. Pat, hi. Good. Good. What are you going to talk about? Give us a little interaction. So let me, uh, I can do this. Wait a let me, let me do two things. First of all, I'm glad to be here. I've never been an opening act of Sarah Palin. I never imagined it in my life. I was, I was here last year to cause some problems because I attacked the, the Republican uh, consultant lobbyist class as a racketeering operation that had not only blown the election, but it looted the system. And I just want to say, I don't want to reprise that other than to say, they understand one thing, if they just hold on, they get all the money back, and that's what's happening. So the people who lost for you before, and who are willing to lose as long as they can preserve their situation, are now in charge of your great, uh, your great hopes for 2014. The, uh, but now their new strategy is, just to say this, is to stand for nothing. Uh, it is to... <laughs> The, what I call the Surrender Caucus. I'm on a show, Political Insiders, with Doug Schoen and John Lombardi, which is a very highly rated program on Sunday night, 7.30, on Fox News. And we talk about this all the time. But whether it was an NLR, NLRB, the uh, decision not to contest spending, the all of the issues that Detman and essentially have a Barack Obama produce a budget which he pulled back everything. The notion has been, if we say nothing and do nothing, we will win in 2014. That's a hell of a way to lose, and it, 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 it has repercussions. I want to say a quick word about my own party, because I'm sort of an apostate for both of them. But, you know, I just want to say this. What I'm appalled at, I mean, I, I describe the two parties, some of you know, as the corrupt party and the stupid party. And actually, they have a lot in common. But Jonathan Turley last week got up in a testimony who is a liberal Democrat law professor and said, look, I agree with Barack Obama's programs, but you have no right to discard the Constitution. We are a constitutional tipping point. What bothers me is why, here's the dog that's not barking. Where was everyone else? No one else speaks up. And I've seen this on Benghazi in my party, on the IRS which should be something that really frightens people, whether it's in Obamacare, most of all in economics, because the people who paid the greatest price under President Obama are the very basis of his coalition, which is blacks, Hispanics, women, and young people have had the greatest loss of income, an issue the Republicans have not been able to manage. But I want to say a moment about the problem, and this gets to the two parties, and I just want to touch on a couple of them as it relates to conservatives and Republicans. One is the rule of law. You know, when Harry Reid decided to have the nuclear option, which he, President Obama, Joe Biden, everyone else opposed when, McConnell, when the Republicans were trying to do it some years ago, as I did, opposed it because you shouldn't overthrow the Constitution. And as the President basically decides, as Jonathan Turley said, that he can rule by fiat without regard to the Constitution, something that even a majority of Democrats oppose. Let me tell you what the Republicans didn't do. The Republican leadership in the Senate, led by Mitch McConnell, which is one of the, as I call it, the Ambrose Burnside of, of American politics. You have to know that was the worst Civil War general of all, and has managed to lose constantly. But he's always surrendering to the Democrats. But on this one, the Republican leadership said, well, we don't like this, but hey, we can't wait to get it. You know what? Sometimes you ought to stand up for the country. The Republicans in the Senate could have shut the Senate down and said, we will not function, we cannot function without unanimous consent in the operation of that body. And they could have said, we will stand up to the Constitution and stand up for people. And they never do. Obamacare, the whole idea of Obama was, let's not say anything and everything will work out for it. There's no alternative. There is no party position the way there was in 1994, which worked quite well. A contract for America, a Republican party position that says here's an alternative. It just presumes that you can get by with uh, with doing what you wish. And I, look, I mean, and the lack of a narrative, a consistent narrative. When the president got up and said, "You can keep your health care program, keep your health care if you like insurance company," it was the greatest lie of the new century. Right? Now, you think that narrative. But by the way, 
American people have come to expect it. By two to one, Americans say, politicians today lie about everything, big or small, and it's not like they're just fibbing like they did in the past. It's threatening democracy. Just like a large majority believe the rule of law is a danger in this country and the democracy. The two issues I want to speak to specifically the IRS, this is where I said a week ago, the Republican leadership is happy with the IRS going after the Tea Party. Can anybody figure this out? Because they're threatened by them, just as Democrats would be threatened by outsiders. That's why they're, that's why John Boehner has no, there is no committee, and best special committee investigating government abuse. They can just occasionally do these things. But again, if they were serious about the IRS, which is a threat to every American without regard to party, because my God, that is a slippery slope. Imagine what's going to happen in the future with other presidents. But I will tell you this. They didn't move to defund the IRS any more than they did to take it out of, the, out of Obamacare. The country doesn't think they should be in either. But they let the woman who gave money to Obama, and they let the stuff go on because they choose and their allies in the lobbyist establishment, consultant establishment, want it to go on. <laughs> Finally, on national defense, and I, remember, I said the other day that Putin had taken his measure of Barack Obama and found his Neville Chamberlain. And on political insiders, the week before he did it, we predicted he would invade, which nobody else was doing because I said it's a sedate land all over again. We don't have time for history lesson. Uh, it is. But I want to say on national security, there's nothing more important, nothing that tells you what's wrong with the political establishment in this country than Benghazi. John Boehner, I, mean, I believe John Boehner cares about his country, but apparently it's about fourth or fifth on his list. <laughs> when you have 180 members of a Republican caucus demanding a special committee, look, this isn't about politics, it's about the truth. And the central truth that has not been addressed is where was the president that night? <laughs> Who invented the talking point? They did not ascend to heaven by some by very God. The people I blame are you for the fact that those 180 members are taking you for a ride, pretending on one side, oh, we want a special committee. They have 180 members. They can bring in the Speaker, Mr. Cantor, and, uh, and Mr. Rogers, and uh, Mr. McCarthy, and say, you either put in a special committee or you're gone tomorrow. Yeah. If they were serious, they are not serious. But this is the problem with our politics. And part of the Benghazi story, of course, is the media. When Bob, you know, the missing, what I said, when Bob, when the real Bob would have replied, this never would have happened. But, you know, even, but they're even conservative commentators, even on my network Fox, who poo poo Benghazi. This is not about politics, it's about the truth. It's about dead Americans, and two thirds of the American people believe there should be a select committee, and 60% of Democrats believe there should be. So you have to ask yourself, what the hell's going on here? The answer is that the political elite, the political class, does not want it. I'm here to tell you, uh, and I want to react on what the future is. We have a system designed, we are told, that only has liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans on, on a very flat axis. But I'm telling you there is a different paradigm. And I will give you the first hint of it. The first hint of it was Syria. You remember Syria last summer? When the president said, after saying, oh, you don't cross the red line, and oh, no, i got to go to war, and I don't want to do and the Republican leadership and the Democratic leadership all united to support the president. And the American people, Democrats, Republicans across the board, rose up and said, the hell you go. And stopped. It was not an organized movement. They just stopped. And we see the same thing with the NSA, where we have the political elite establishment, the Lindsey Grahams, the Rogers, the others telling us how great it is that they're spying on you. And everyone else in the country, particularly young people, going, this is appalling. But we don't have that kind of vision. There is a new paradigm. And what I want to tell you, for several months, since September, I've been, since the summer, involved in a research project, not a poll, but a project, exploring whether or not there's another politics coming. And I am not here today to, to go through it. I will tell you this. In that black bag, in that blue bag, someday will be a black bag, is what I call the Candidate Smith Project. 
And Candidate Smith is about a whole new paradigm, a whole new organization of politics. And I'll tell you what it's based on. It's based on the 80% of the American people who believe the American dream is harder to attain. The 62 thirds of Americans who believe the system is rigged. For those, if you're trying to work hard, you can't achieve the American dream because the system is rigged. And the two thirds of Americans who now believe that the, if you work hard, you can't succeed. You can't make it. You can't change yourself. This violates everything we believe about America. And more, most importantly, in the 65% of the American people who believe that their children will have a lesser future than they have. The, the religious tenet of our civic religion in this country is you give your children better than you have. And I have said before, if you kill that idea, you, there will still be a United States, but there will be no America. That idea existed before there was an anti government. It is what, and that vision of what to do, you know, but I'm just going to read you a conclusion about what I've been working on. Because the alienation one, the American people believe the system is rigged, that it's corrupt. We, these numbers are higher, and I, I started this 40 years ago. In the 80, it's in the 80 almost 90%. At least two thirds, or seventy-five percent or more, who believe the system is rigged. We need real democracy and real free enterprise. That the political class works against the people. We need new leadership. And most of all, the three quarters of the American people believe the government in Washington does not operate with the consent of the people. That that is a pre-revolutionary moment. And I just want to point to the difference between the reality of the current political structure, where the American people. Is not merely a chasm in bridge. We are dealing with a literally alternative universe, one of political, media, and establishment that reflects the current condition, and another alternate universe the American people who totally reject that and desire a total refashioning of the conduct of this nation's political life and yearn for true reform. They see a resurgence of both their own sovereignty and a resurgence of America. They understand that if you don't fix this political system, which is so corrupt and broken, and serves the people in it, you will never deal with any of the problems you care about. will never get solved. That the corruption has got to be rooted out because it is poisoning the country. And most of all, we need a resurgent America. And we need to return to the dominant, true ideology of the American people, which is common sense. That appeals across the board. I am telling you that from 65 to 75 percent of the American people are prepared to enlist. And the Candidate Smith Project all tells me that you can win it if you win the right things, either as a Democrat, a Republican, or Independent. But I will tell you what they also say to the political class and the media and those in the establishment who dominate this country. There's a message, and the message is the people are coming, and they're coming for you. The question is whether we're going to do that, have that in a positive way that gives resurgence to our values as a country, or whether in 2040 or even before that we are going to be visited by a politics I guarantee none of you in this room wish to have. But that the moment is at hand, and it is comes every 40 years we have changed. But I am telling you, this is as big a moment as it was prior to the Civil War, and the change we're looking at will be decisive. And the people in this room and the American people, whatever they claim to be, who live outside that beltway and outside that elite, are ready to reclaim their country because they have to. If this were a panel and the, these two guys were contestants, I would say Pat Cadell won. Was that, was that a fair <laughs> statement? You're like, oh, that's not right. I mean, we put out. Well, you are exactly. very good. I don't care what you say. You are great. <laughs> now, let me say something about demographics and what, what these guys were going to talk about in a way did. Uh, if demographics mm. is uh, the future of where elections are going to go, demographics destiny, uh, and that's true, when it's, except when it's not true, this country, by the, if you live to be in, into the 2040s in the United States, you will be living in a socialist America. This is, a, this is something that neither parties 
uh, consultants, with all due respect, will tell you because it ruins their living. But to believe that Asians and Hispanics vote Democratic in such overwhelming numbers because they really want to believe in the kind of tough line that conservatives give, that is self-reliance, uh, smaller government, uh, you're on your own unless there's some reason you can't really help yourself, in which case the community should be helping you. That line is not going to work. I don't think there's anybody in this room who actually believes that the reason that George W. Bush won Hispanics was he persuaded Hispanics that the capitalist model was the best model. Plenty of Hispanics want come to this country because they want the capitalist model. Plenty. And they do very well. Obviously, that's true of Asians. But if you're looking at big numbers, it's not true. Just look at the data. Just look at the way the vote has been going. So what does that tell you? It tells you that you're going to hear from the Republicans, and maybe from uh, Dr. Cadell here, that the, if the Republicans simply go out and appeal directly to Hispanics and Asians, well, uh, they will, the Republicans will bring them over. On what basis? The people who already believe in self-reliance, who are of Hispanic or Asian uh, origin, already feel that way. That's why they came here. Others came here for a mixture of reasons, because they wanted opportunity, but they believed that in the welfare state, the welfare state that the United States is. Is there anybody here that denies that this is a welfare state? I don't think so. So, where does this go? I would love to hear someone tell me, realistically, how the inevitable path to socialism can be stopped in our lifetime. Do I, hear, do I see any hands? Yeah, right here. Okay. <laughs> because what people want is exactly what many people who've wanted, who've come to America for centuries have wanted. They want an opportunity to succeed. They want an opportunity to get a good education. They want an opportunity to better their lot. And socialism does not do that, Ralph. Well, socialism doesn't do that. It's a capitalist system with free markets, with lower taxes, and why limited are they government that creates that opportunity. Why are they voting Democrats? Huh? Because we haven't reached out to them enough. Here's a, here's a key, Ralph. If people don't think they like you, they're not likely to vote for you. Well, if they don't, we've got to demonstrate that we want all kinds of people of different races, different creeds, different colors, different origins in our coalition, in our center-right coalition. We know we will want our socialists. Let me just jump in here. Let me just say, you can never win them, and this is the failure of the, of the Republican Party. When you convince people that you're against them and that you're not for them, they're not going to vote for them. Yep. The fact of the matter is, when I talked about the, the Candidate Smith Project, the overwhelming majority, it includes women, single women, black people, Hispanics. They, people want the American dream, but if you cannot articulate a vision, when you have 94% of the American people who believe the economic policies of both parties have failed and do not deliver opportunity and better jobs and better, because they don't, what gets feathered is at the top, whether it's crony capitalism, or the people with money. That's what they fear. When, the par when a party begins to speak to the people with passion, as opposed to preserving arrangements, that's how you change it. And the way things are going, the voters are going to vote for at least somebody who at least claims to be for them. I want to agree with, with Pat so desperately, and in a way I do, because the future lies with the Republican Party, not the Democratic well, or Party. So we already know where the Democratic Party is taking us. We, we know where the Republican Party says it wants to take us. But every time a Republican stands, an office holder, uh, a Ted Cruz or a Rand Paul or a Mike Lee stands up and does something for principle and is willing to go down fighting, knowing that he's going to lose, but standing up for principle to explain to the to the uh, electorate what Republican, conservative, capitalist principles are, the party unites against him, makes fun of him, says he's, he's crazy or she's crazy, and the, uh, the press says the same thing, and then everybody piles on, and everybody believes, therefore, that if the Republican Party really stands up for pr its principles of smaller government, 
and individual responsibility, candidates like that will lose and take the party down with them. So, if the Republican Party is the only hope for the future, and its office holders, its leadership, insist on demonizing, ridiculing rep fellow Republicans who stand up for principle, then where is the future? Socialism. Well, I, I just I have to dissent on the belief that only the Republican Party, whether the Republican Party will reform itself, or it's going the way of the winds. I'm just, I'm sorry. There will be some other new coalition to speak to what is there. You cannot continue to suppress the dissent in America, which is what the political establishment of both parties does. You're right, when people do stand up for principle or some other, you have a Republican Party that laid down on the debt and on the spending limits over the, it did not even protect military pensions, the mistake they made, because they decided if we just lay down and surrender, we will win. Well, you know what? The problem is, when I talk about candidate spend, you know what? 60% of, more than 60% of Republicans are willing to leave their party immediately for a better alternative. It's not about parties, it's about their country. And let me just say this, the political class in this town, in this beltway, which has gorged itself by looting the country and our political system. Let me tell you one thing. They put politics, they put party ahead of country, they put politics ahead of principle, and they put their privileged access ahead of their patriotism. And until we replace that, what party matters? has caught the temper of the times, at least the temper of these times, in this room. Thank you, Pat. Well, you and I are not going to agree on the future, but I hope you're right. It's a lot more hopeful than you think it is, Ralph. Trust me. <laughs> Good. Thank you all. Hope you've enjoyed this panel. Hope you've learned something.